So we have a new segment for everybody. It's called the Scorcher. <laughs> Adam's no, trying it's to tell not. Us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, I can't read my own handwriting. This week, we're watching Season 8, Episode 1, Revenge of the Creature, which also happens to be the first MST3K episode on the Sci-Fi Network. And the second in the Creature from the Black Lagoon movies, featuring everybody's favorite monster, Gilman. But first, we have some follow-up. With respect to our Gamera episodes, we received some listener feedback from Rob. (laughs) I'm not ready for a Gamuary hangover. Beth, are you willing to read the letter? All right. The 90s Gamera trilogy are among the finest kaiju films of all time. I will confess to being a Gamera apologist, but I can also admit that the series as a whole deserves the razzing it gets. That's the charm. But the 90s Gamera films are superior to any of the Godzilla films of the 90s and 2000s. Shin Godzilla is awesome, but you know that already. Well, thank you, Rob. And you know what? It's been a long time since I've seen the entire uh, Gamera trilogy. I, uh, I have enough of a soft spot for the 90s King Ghidorah and Mechagodzilla movies that I'd be willing to argue that. But more importantly, Rob, what do you think of the, maybe not greatest, but certainly my favorite Godzilla movie? 1989's Godzilla vs. Biolanti, where he fights a plant monster and there's a bunch of psychics and a fake country is trying to steal Godzilla cells. Please write in. I want to talk to you about this. (laughs) But that's just one look of love. There's also a very important thing in terms of when we're releasing this episode. Valentine's Day. Yes. So if you're a monster man, kidnap a lady. It's what you're supposed to do. I got to say, I I think Valentine's Day more and more is just such a site of resentment for so many people. Like it's not only just for the singles, but also for... Uh, those of us in established relationships who have to be reminded every year that we don't give a shit about our relationship anymore. And the spark <laughs> is gone. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. No box of turtles can salvage that one. Oh, turtles again, huh? Thanks. All the way down. <laughs> this time we watched Season 8, Episode 1, Revenge of the Creature. A couple of scientists... Trophy hunters trek into the Amazon to locate the mysterious Gill Man, a creature that's part fish, part man, and as we'll soon discover, part Papy Le Pew. After successfully capturing the creature using dynamite to stun him, Gill Man is sent to the Ocean Harbor Oceanarium in Florida, where it's chained to the bottom of a pool to be gawked at by slack jawed yokels. He's also occasionally cattle prodded by animal psychologist and pickup artist Professor Cleet Ferguson while Helen Dobson, ichthyologist and pretty young girl, uh, that's the movie's description, watches in hazy detachment. Ah, but Gilman can't help but feel something for Helen. After all, there's not a lot of females to go around in this movie. So he does the classic movie monster thing and schleps her unconscious body along the coast of Florida. By the way, R.I.P. Helen's dog, who is one of the many animals unfortunate enough to be in this movie. Anyway, don't worry, Cleet gets his woman back by telling the Gilman to stop. A Pavlovian response he apparently instilled during his and Helen's aimless, slipshod training sessions on the creature. Anyway, having compliantly given back the girl, Gilman is rewarded by a barrage of bullets, and we leave the corpse of our beloved anti-hero floating in the Everglades. All in all, a great day for science. Ever return from summer vacation after your best friend moved away and now there's a new kid in class who's sitting at your old bestie's desk? Worse, this is the kid that likes to push you in the dirt and spit on you. That's what happens to Mike. He, Gypsy, and Servo return to the Satellite of Love after transcending the corporeal and becoming pure light last season, only to find Crow already there. Still no word on the whereabouts of Magic Voice. Crow remembers everyone but Mike and takes an instant dislike to the Midwestern schlub. Crow's built a brand new interior set since the old one was destroyed by the ravages of time and cancellation. Plus, he's given the SOL a garish new lighting scheme. Mike makes contact with Earth only to find a planet of apes. And not the apes we call mankind, but walking and talking apes named Bobo and Peanut, who inform the SOL crew that it's 2525 AD, and their movie this week is the sequel to Creature from the Black Lagoon. 
Crow introduces the gang to the sub-microscopic nanobots that now live on and maintain the ship in Segment 2. Mike gets the nanites working on controls for the SOL so he can steer it back to Earth and get everybody back to their rightful time in the 90s. Crow still doesn't much care for Mike, but he's not the only bot with secrets. A squid monster hails the ship in Segment 3, demanding a treasure chest of pudding Tom Servo owes him. Servo must have had a Han Solo phase during his time as a being of pure light. In Segment 4, the bots enjoy cappuccinos. Crow still doesn't remember Mike. That's it. In the wrap-up, we get Revelations. Not of the biblical variety, but we do learn Mike's family has been getting biblical with apes. That's why Earth's been taken over by stupid ape men. On the planet of the apes, Mike and the bots meet the simian scientist's human lawgiver, Pearl Forrester. She's made it ape law to send the SOL gang movies after the death of beloved OG mad, Dr. Forrester. MST3K, perhaps hoping to outdo the way it botched Dr. Earhart's departure, writes out Clayton Forrester by killing him off with a throwaway line. Next! Well, Beth, what did you make of this episode? It was a dog's breakfast. Yeah. There were some delicious bacon bits in there, but also some very old peas. (laughs) Wait, what? (laughs) What have you been feeding your dog? The leftovers. Well, that's what dogs are for, right? I don't know. I never had a dog. Oh, I see. I I, I just kind of assumed that the dog's breakfast would just be the bacon strips that he usually gets. How's it going to know? But yeah, this 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 one, I would describe this episode as a dog, which is weird because I remember it being a lot better than it was. I don't remember what sci-fi episode was the first episode I ever watched. It wasn't this one. And I think if it had, I might have had a little bit more hope for the series. They certainly, they have a lot of energy. The segments have a lot going on. Man, their, their yeah. set budget just went through the roof. And, you know, I, I even liked Bobo at first. It was kind of cute. And there's a lot of uh, interesting references to other sci-fi properties going on, and which is kind of cute. But, you know, the thing that turned me off the sci-fi era most, probably unjustifiably so, was the new voice of Crow by uh, Bill Corbett. And I can't help but I think that it's not just his voice that kind of rubbed me the wrong way, but a certain kind of abrasiveness that we get with Crow from the first moment he says anything. Like, he's just unnecessarily hostile in a way that is not actually all that fun to watch. Yeah, I, uh, I, I would agree there. It's funny, that didn't bother me when I first watched it, probably because I was curious as to what they were going to do. And so Crow... Crow's senility slash selective memory, uh, or or maybe even the possibility that he's an imposter, whatever it was that they were going for in these early episodes before they dropped it, that was interesting to me. But just just watching the episode, it's like I, I think the that the riffs in general are kind of a dud. Mm. But I did think that the change, like all of the changes, like Trace's departure, uh, Bill becoming a full time cast member, having to rejig the show. Not only to make up for the aforementioned departure, but also to fit in with the sci-fi network. All of that seemed to give uh, Best Brains a kind of energy. So even when the sketches aren't always hilarious, they're like interesting, like they're trying, which is something that we do not get in the episodes we've watched from seasons 9 and 10. And the riffs weren't fantastic, but it had a kind of easy rhythm that reminded me a lot of season 6 and 7. And that Again, if I had watched this at first, I would have had a lot of hope for the series going forward. That said, this was one of the most difficult movies I've ever had to watch. It was really hard. There's a lot ethically going on in this movie that I think is very hard for a modern, thoughtful person to be able to uh, to consume. Oh, boy. <laughs> well, first of all, not all gill men. <laughs> and secondly, yes, <laughs> this is uh, this is actually quite a depressing movie to watch with a modern eye. And uh, not just because, you know, you, you watch this movie and you go, oh, yeah, Gilman, he loves ladies. And that's kind of going to be the only weird thing about it, because that's the only kind of arcane 50s thing about the original Creature from the Black Lagoon, I think. But this movie is painfully 50s in all respects. Mm hmm. It's competently directed, it has a great monster, and that's it. Before we get into some of that stuff, I am just curious, what did you think of old Gilman? He's a goofy-looking monster. There ain't nothing much about him. He's another grotesque uh, rubber suit from the 50s. 
but what what goes around him like the what people think of him the context he's put in that's the interesting part and at first i thought that this movie seemed to be going for a kind of verhoven level of irony in terms of just how cruelly this creature is treated for no discernible reason beyond like the facade of science but no they're fully fully locked into that in a way that doesn't doesn't have a sense of self scrutiny about it at all and that is depressing <laughs> uh you know it's interesting you could remake this script with a verhoven like director with someone w- who, with an eye on satire and again take the same script word for word and make it about an indictment <laughs> of all the male characters in the movie and their treatment of animals and make Gilman almost the hero of the movie Mm -hmm. (laughs) because he practically is at this point um he's i would say he's the only likable aspect of the movie if only because the scientist lady that he falls in love with whose name i don't even remember helen (laughs) is it yeah (laughs) i was gonna say tara (laughs) as that was the best guess i could give yeah she is such a uh, She's not even like a character from Archie Digest. She is a character in the background watching the Riverdale gang get snacks. Like she is so nondescript. And I don't I didn't care for a minute what happens to her. And I'm like, eh, creature wants a trophy wife. <laughs> That's fine. It's not like he's kidnapping someone with an inner life anyway. And he at least had the decency to kill her dog. <laughs> she is oh uh she's poised. That is probably the only word you can give to her as a characterization. Uh and that said, I think Gilman as a design and as a creature from the Black Lagoon or otherwise, totally rules. Oh, and, yeah. I, and as a matter of fact, while I am not wearing my creature from the Black Lagoon shirt, in the room where I always record this podcast, I am right in front of a framed picture. A framed picture of Gilman. <laughs> well, I'm sorry that I did not. Uh, I'm not fully appreciating the genius of the costume. I will admit, like there's a there's a lot of intricate design in the fins and the scales and the face. Although unfortunate, is very horrifying. So if that's what they were going for, is it it does the job well? I guess compared to the other '50s monsters, it looks like there was actually a concept behind it, as opposed to just a bunch of crazy crap thrown together. Well, I mean, like I I don't know if uh, Gilman was designed by Jack Pierce, who uh, designed the other Universal monsters like Wolfman and Frankenstein. Frankenstein, of course, being the name of Dr. Frankenstein's son, the monster, because Frankenstein's actual monster is hubris. Thank you. Now, (laughs) uh, Gilman, unfortunately, in the sequels gets tragic redesign problems because in the first movie, he looks incredible. And here they're already taking shortcuts and uh, safety concerns um, (laughs) into consideration because in the original film, the people who were in the Gilman suit are totally blind because Gilman has piercing yellow eyes like he's one of the Village of the Damned kids. Oh, I see. And you, uh, there was no oxygen tank or, or any kind of oxygen apparatus in the suit originally. I was going to say, was the problem breathing? <laughs> well, that's just it. They hired a guy who could hold his breath for four minutes. So they could always get four straight minutes of underwater Gilman footage without any trace of bubbles, that which would give away... The action here, you'll notice that Gilman's head's a little bit looser on the actor and bubbles are coming out of his neck stump constantly and also out of the now eye holes because like you can kind of see the actor's eyes this time. Um, So the creature who looks incredible in the first movie looks okay here. Okay, so mostly in the head face, it's different. Yeah, mostly that Uh, we have in our show notes that somebody here thinks that Gilman has a nice caboose. Yes, it's Tom Servo. (laughs) Uh, I believe the line, which is the one line I really remembered from the episode both times I watched it, which would be in the late 90s and now, which was Tom's one line, which I thought was the one great line in the episode. He's the only fish with a butt. (laughs) Well, that's what happens when you're a swimmer. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, But it did uh, get me thinking about, like, why was this such a pervasive trope? in the 50s and 60s and 70s the idea of the monster who really wants to make it with a human chick uh and as you pointed out this is basically the king kong story Mm -hmm. kind of terrifyingly so when you think about that yeah and roger corman of course 
probably took it to its most extreme with oh what was the name of that stupid humanoids from the deep yes yeah the less said about that movie the better (laughs) and i was really surprised when i tried to do some research about this that even on tv tropes which is notorious for you know being gross uh, and unnecessarily (laughs) thorough didn't point that this is point out that this is a trope that exists and is very pervasive oh really Uh, yeah i thought at least that's shocking yeah, at least for this movie, it's not mentioned, even though it's one of the most obvious things about it. And so I haven't had a chance to really dig into kind of the cultural reasons for that. But I have my theories, and they're very dark. I'm curious to hear about that, because as far as I can tell, I mean, Creature from the Black Lagoon plays into the aforementioned King Kong thing, where you have a creature who is not quite beast and not quite man, captivated by a Hollywood beauty. And is not necessarily a sexual uh is not experiencing necessarily sexual desire i would say but like a desire to mate as the last of his species that has not seen another creature remotely like him for a long time that gets pretty problematic when you think of skull island and the fact that there are tons of human women there but in creature from the black lagoon at the very least i mean they're in the remote amazon no one is there. Creature is mostly just feasting on whatever happens to come into its path. And then a bunch of uh, scientists come in and he starts to wreak havoc. And we sort of see the same thing with with Ega later on, which copies both King Kong and Creature. Right. I was just going to say. Um, I, I even asked my, my husband about this and he's like, well, you know, this has been – he suggested that this is like a, a perpetual, you know, heteronormative trope where you even have – you know, women being kidnapped by dragons is just an opportunity for, you know, a man to win his prize. But I actually think in this specific context, something a, maybe a little bit more sinister is going on. Hmm. Adam, do you know why there was an uptick in black lynchings at the turn of the century? Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> oh, You want to explain to our audience? Oh, good. I get that. Um, All right. Well, it was essentially for any kind of, um, not even contact, but any kind of of flirtation or communication even of the most basic variety with white women. Yeah. And and there's been some recent scholarship that suggests that the kind of sex panic that happened at that moment was triggered by women's push for uh for voting rights that they took that kind of paranoia about the lack of control they had over women and kind of transferred it on to you know the marginalized other and frankly women did not help this they were uh white women were kind of in a lot of ways full participants in this and usually like all of these monsters it's a white woman you know it's a it's it, it's turning that specific ideal into a universal trope. Everybody wants to make it with our women because they're the best women and we have to protect our women from these monsters. You know, that is, I think, unconscious bias that is going on behind this. I could be wrong. I'd like to be wrong, but I don't <laughs> think I am. Wouldn't we all like to be wrong, Beth? <laughs> well, I, I will say something. For one, like, I do think these movies are like King Kong and Creature from the Black Lagoon and a lot of older movies with this trope are being made by white people with largely white casts. And in the original creature from the black lagoon, there's one woman. So it's, it's more a matter of default. Like I think you can read into the films with, Oh, they're after our women. And in King Kong, it's certainly like, this is the superior woman, a, an an American blonde. But I think with Gilman, I think, I think there's that element of tragedy to it. I think specifically with him, you're supposed to feel both frightened and sad. There's something desperate and and horrible about the fact that he can't pass on his genes. And really, what's he going to do with that lady? He's just going to squirt a bunch of eggs on her or whatever the hell gill men do. <laughs> going to get a bunch of mandibles out? I don't know. But there is something confused about it. He, I think... It really is going to attract a lot of empathy from adolescents. Yeah, I, I have to admit that if I just kind of let my my kind of feminist horror 
on the side go for a moment. It was kind of funny that he just didn't seem to quite know what to do with her and just kept laying her unconscious corpse on the beach while he went to go into the water because he had to breathe. He really <laughs> doesn't seem to know what to do with her now that he's got her. Yeah. And like Gilman's getting like a pounding throughout the film and he's constantly getting tortured and he finally gets a lady and he's escaped and he's all excited. And then he's like, wait, what the hell am I supposed to do with this? <laughs> I'm a fish person. <laughs> I uh, where 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 is her respective blowhole? I don't know where it is. Cries Gilman. All of this makes you know the range of the creature so hard to watch because it actually does feel like in different hands this movie could almost be making a point about how nobody is recognizing the innate humanity of Gilman. You know, however monstrous it is. You know, <laughs> that's true. Although luckily they have made that movie now. It's called The Shape of Water, and I just watched it this morning. <laughs> Oh, he did. I've really wanted to see it. Is it really responding to these uh, creature movies? Yes. Guillermo del Toro actually tried to make, he's one of a dozen really great horror directors who's tried to make a Creature from the Black Lagoon remake for like ages and ages. But The Shape of Water plays very much with the imagery of creature and the creature movies and Gilman. And the monster or the fish person (laughs) looks almost identical to Gilman. Mm. And I I tell you, I I thought I was going to be watching a fun monster movie. What I was not expecting, Beth, was to be crying for two full hours. (laughs) Really? It's a beautiful but also heartbreaking movie. And if, I I, I swear to God, if Richard Jenkins isn't given the key to the city for his performance in that movie, and Sally Hawkins isn't main queen to the moon for her performance in that movie, then there's no justice. So, as uh, we've mentioned, the men in this movie are all terrible. Yeah, Gilman's the nicest one. <laughs> and and he's and we're pretty sure he he's trying to rape a woman and he kills a dog. Yeah. Yeah, he's and and yet he still wins the nice guy awards by a country mile. And who is a better poster boy for the nice guy awards than Gilman? <laughs> Cuz the scientist, like the 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 lead scientist guy, John Agar, who we'll see again later this season, he's terrible he really is he might be the least likable person we've ever watched in a 1950s b movie for this show and we started with rocket ship xm yeah you just get this trope of these arrogant know-it-all know-nothing alpha men who apparently were what women were given to try to aspire to (laughs) he's not and i i think it's crow that makes the comment uh that when he smiles, the smile does not reach his eyes. They are dead. Yeah. Again, with a with a better director, there would be a lot of comedy or at least something very sinister uh, being mined for this. And the, the script almost makes him unintentionally creepier just by giving him the name Cleet. <laughs> yeah. Like he's a goddamn Bond henchman. Yeah. And it was just really like, again, I thought, oh, maybe this movie will be interesting because between him and the Amazonian guy, Joe, there was almost like an Eve Sedgwick uh, homosocial love triangle going on. Basically, the idea that, uh, especially in early Hollywood, you can't express or you can't depict homosexual desire. So if you want to allude to those feelings, you have two best friends who really like each other kind of work through those feelings through a woman, you know? So they're both kind of romantically involved with a woman and it's through that triangle that you kind of get those feelings of homosociality, homosexuality out in a deflected way. Hmm. Which is so against the modern sensibility of just getting involved in what we call an Eiffel Tower and saying no homo while you high five. I think the best example of this I've ever seen is the cabinet of Dr. Caligari, where you have two very pretty, pretty German men uh, in full like silent movie makeup, who obviously are the best of friends. And when a lady shows up, it's just like she's a play toy for them to get uh, their jollies out for each other. And it, well, it's interesting that you mentioned that just because I, I find that kind of queer subtext is, well, I don't find this. Everyone finds this. <laughs> um, but queer subtext is very much at home in the horror genre. Mm-hmm. And you have films that are almost as explicitly as you can get about being gay as would be like available at the time like dracula's daughter is very much the story of a lesbian but except the word for lesbian is vampire (laughs) 
Well, even this could almost be read as, and and I'm not the first to point this out, but how monsters are often coded as gay and and the way they're treated by society and their outsider status. And frankly, the way he's, uh, Gilman is treated kind of has these pseudo medical feelings about it that kind of is similar to what uh, happened to gay men in the late 19th and early 20th century. The way, you know, they were institutionalized and examined and monitored and uh, medicalized, I think is the word for it. Well, hell, I mean, this even, and again, of all things, Revenge of the Creature, even more than the original film, is calling out for a really good remake. Because you could argue that what's happening to Creature there, too, would be a great metaphor for what's happening with Christian, you know, same-sex re-education camps and things like that. Mm -hmm. he's having his desires modified that way. It's horrifying. And again, you you really feel for Gilman. Although, how great would it be if about 20 minutes in, because you know what? Gilman, he's all full of hormones. He doesn't know what he wants. What if, after immediately seeing, what's her name? Regiette? What what the hell was her (laughs) name? The lady scientist? Helen. All right. So, so... uh, (laughs) So, Helen. Uh, He sees Helen. He's all hot and bothered. But then he sees Joe. (laughs) <laughs> and he immediately carts him off into the ocean. He did have the nicer body of the two leads, I gotta say. Yeah, although I'm, I'm sure there's a strict edict about these movies where it says, it's Adam and Eve, not Adam and Fish person. <laughs> although, speaking of uh, male bodies on display, that's another kind of disappointing thing about this movie, is uh, Mike and the bots are not comfortable looking at men. And they make that very clear. <laughs> yeah, and the kind of... Not that there's anything wrong with that joking around that they're doing, but not really, is very 90s. But it also is very loudly ringing the frat house template, I would describe, for the riffs throughout the sci-fi years. And it doesn't help by the fact that they just go right along with the movie's assumption that the female scientist doesn't actually know anything. Yeah. Yeah, that was disappointing. This is the kind of film that would have gotten a very different treatment had it been done in season four, say. I think so. I mean, we can never say what would have happened because it never did. But just given how Joel or even Mike in the earlier shows responded to these kind of put upon women was very different. At least when you get to the one catcalling scene in the episode where uh, Crow and Servo are salivating over... uh, is her name Ronette? What the hell is her name? <laughs> yes, it's Ronette. All right. So when 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 Doctor Ronnie is is lounging about, uh, the the comments are at the very least only going to the bots with Mike somewhat embarrassed by it. Mm. Which, if you're going to do those jokes, at least is the best way to go about it. It's not much, but that's the only defense I have. <laughs> like I said, this is a super lackluster episode. <laughs> uh, I have nothing more to say. Cue the music. <laughs> thank you i wish i could do that all the time <laughs> it'd be a great way to get out of any awkward situation <laughs> sorry i have a dog barking cue and now i must leave <laughs> it's a good thing that you're going for drinks at tgi fridays circa 1970 <laughs> uh okay well speaking of animals they're treated badly in this movie yes and Although we see most of that through the eyes of the made-up animal, we do get some lab experiments from some really dumb scientists. Well, we open into Cleet's animal behavior lab. That sounds friendly. Where a lady is treating a chimp with the same level of condescension as that one white lady in the color purple (laughs) to some poor black kids. I honestly thought you were blanking on the lady scientist's name just like I was. Don't need to say, oh, you adorable thing. (laughs) Aren't you great? Can you put up your hand? Oh, what? you're so smart. You're like a four-year-old. It's especially weird uh, seeing everybody acting so casually around the chimp, presuming that they still have their faces and genitalia intact. <laughs> yeah, this is just it. Like, it's also just kind of irresponsible to suggest that chimps are cute pet-like creatures because they will destroy you. Yeah. Like, there was, of course, well, I think there's more than one gaze. But, I mean, recently, like, the very first time I heard about it, it was a news story. I think it was about a decade ago, and the woman ended up on Oprah after. But she had a pet little monkey. And, of course, the monkey turned eight, went through monkey puberty, 
murdered her friend, ripped her face and hands off. And then went on Oprah and be like, oh, but I love that monkey. Meanwhile, her face is stapled on upside down. <laughs> yes, uh, they are terrifyingly strong. Ugh. I don't understand why they're so strong. <laughs> it, it, it's like seeing people fawn over a champ. It's like you do realize they're only slightly less vicious than baboons, right? And you do realize that monkeys are basically always masturbating, right? <laughs> when they're not flinging shit, they're flinging themselves. Like, I, I really just, I, I really don't like monkeys. Maybe it's because they're so close to humans, but in, like, a lot of the most unsettling ways, but it's just, ugh. With the exception of the baboon, who is pure evil, I, I respect all of the apes, but I don't want to be near the apes because I think they should have their own thing, and I am terrified of having my hands, face, or genitals misplaced forcibly by another creature. That That's what I'll say. I, I completely respect and honor apes and monkeys and i think that some of the more terrifying aspects of their behavior tend to come out when they're placed in captivity yeah speaking of which uh there's also a cat in a cage for some reason with a bunch of rats <laughs> which just seems like they're going to be making a faces of death movie <laughs> like honestly what is the purpose of that uh but it is made all the better by the fact that our uh clumsy clueless scientist with a uh, crest toothpaste hair played by Clint Eastwood <laughs> is like I don't know what happened to the mouse the mouse was eaten by this cat I guess bones and all oh we should explain the the experiment is a cat will not eat or or predators will not eat if they're not hungry it, it just the example of uh of bad science that goes on here. Like, of course a cat's going to eat a rat even if it's not hungry. Cats are very cruel creatures, and they enjoy killing for sport. Much like Gilman, I gotta side with cats on this one. Cats always get my vote. I always think they're in the clear, morally speaking. Um, and uh, uh, there's dolphins. That was another, like, another example of this movie's, like, real dissonance in terms of, like, what it's trying to say. Because what happens to the Gilman seems very cruel. Yes. They they dynamite him unconscious. Uh, they transport him to a foreign place. They chain him down for the amusement of all of the the plebs. Uh, it's, it it feels like they're trying to make a point about captivity, and then they switch on to look at these happy dolphins <laughs> jumping through hoops. <laughs> because of course, in order to get this movie, they had to use uh, Florida's marine land, and. They wouldn't be good guests if they made them look bad. Yeah, they, they do have permission to film there, so naturally they have to make nice. I wouldn't say I'm like a huge animal rights activist, but I really hate zoos. And I really hate aquatic zoos. Like, there's just no way that the animals aren't miserable in those conditions. Yeah. And, like, especially since this was the first one, I have to imagine that the, the tanks were so small and so primitive. It would have just been a nightmare. Well, I mean, what's really upsetting about these things, and you don't think about them when you're dragged to zoos and sea worlds and things like that when you're a kid, because I imagine your parents took you to those places too. Mm -hmm. But, you know, then you have the wonder of just being near these beautiful animals. But as you get older, even just slightly older, you realize, oh, for, for committing no crime, animals are just put in prison. <laughs> and it's very depressing. Yeah, actually, I think I was about um, 10 or 11 when we went to the Toronto Zoo and I saw a beautiful tiger, but it was not behaving properly. It was pacing uh, in a really like just along the cage. And I did some reading. That's that's those kinds of repetitive movements. You only get that with animals in the zoo. Like it's it's not something that would ever happen in the wild. Honestly, the best alternative you have is, if you do want to see these animals, is something that grew out of the need to re rehabilitate these animals after they've spent so much time in captivity, which, of course, are the like animal rescues, like the big cat rescues and things like that, which admittedly is exactly the kind of thing that I would love to go see because they're, they're being treated considerably better and they are trying to rehabilitate all the cats there at a big cat rescue. And I also have that innate childlike desire to <laughs> hang around a bunch of lions and tigers and, uh, what is it, carcerals? What are they? How is that pronounced? It's a particular kind of cat that has almost lynx-like ears, but uh, it is always, uh, it, it, it tends to pant like a dog. I can't remember what it's called. Uh, well, I will say that at least in those situations, the focus is on the animal and not on the humans looking at the animals. Yeah, and they're not made to do tricks. The tricks is that they're, the trick 
the one trick that they do is that they are a cool animal. Caracal, C A R A C A L. Ah, uh, there we go. But yeah, uh, and that was another thing. Like the trick that they're ostensibly trying to teach the Gilman is is what exactly? I could not like. I understand how like Pavlovly and ideas work. Is you 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 punish the behavior you don't want and you reward the behavior you do want. But it just looked like they were just trying to fuck with them, which honestly feels real unintentionally it feels very real how much better would this movie have been beth if the creature auditioned to be part of a sea circus show works very hard on his act falls in love with a dolphin but is also or i don't know a whale or something whatever a fish man would want (laughs) and uh there's a love triangle between him and i don't know a blowfish (laughs) <laughs> and there's nearly a big accident before uh before before his his big stunt he loses his contract he has to go back into the amazon he's just got all of his memories of the time he was once the greatest show on earth that's a movie <laughs> this this is just like i said depressing it's a reminder of what actually happens but without any underlying commentary about it it's just like they copied it mm. it's just like they they oh that's what they do well, we'll do that and we'll just apply it to creature on a grander scale. And also, we mentioned before uh, Helen's dog, is that Chris. <laughs> Helen's dog, Chris. <laughs> yes, his yes, name is the dog's Chris. name is Chris. <laughs> the worst name for a dog. I mean, really, like Chris. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is another weird thing about this movie. Is like literally every male thing has to have a heart on for Helen, including she suggests her own dog. Now, in fairness, owning a dog means that it does have a heart on for you at all times, Beth. <laughs> but she introduces him as basically like her boyfriend, which I know is not literal, but it just kind of adds to this pile up on how much she is just the most f***able thing in the universe. <laughs> Well, having been a, a, a man uh, dating other single ladies with dogs, mm-hmm. I have heard this song and dance before. <laughs> this really? is not an uncommon thing to hear. It's like, oh, this is a dog. He's practically my boyfriend. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, this isn't going to work out. <laughs> I don't own a dog costume. <laughs> yeah, dog relationships are pretty intense. I admire them, but I, I I am looking at them from afar. Whereas I am disgusted by it. Send all of your hate mail to Beth at it's just a show dot com. <laughs> R.I.P. Chris. <laughs> R.S.V.P. Chris. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just a cheap thing for. It's weird because it's like that should be a moment where everyone boos the creature. Like if anything, that scene almost should have happened, as if Cleet killed the dog by accident trying to shoot creature because creature is sort of portrayed as somewhat innocent aside from the fact that he hates anything that's on a table (laughs) or if there's a door or a gate he hates that there is a great gif by the way a great gif which is gilman a montage of all of all three movies where he is just knocking it over because that's his thing and the (laughs) caption is just fuck this and i love it (laughs) I think that captures the heart as to why I love this monster. <laughs> I have to admit, if I was somehow transported back into the 50s, I would also be f- this about everything. Now, before we do anything else, I want to play a game. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> do you think Revenge of the Creature is both A, a good title, and B, a good title for a sequel to a movie with an evocative title like Creature from the Black Lagoon? Uh, no, it's a dumb, it's a dumb, the most vaguest of names. Why they didn't just go with Revenge of the Creature of the Black Lagoon? Did they just not like those two ofs? Well, here's the thing. Revenge of the Creature was decided during production, and somebody at Universal Studios, I think a few somebodies, just plain hated that title. Hmm. <laughs> So they came up with a list of 50 alternatives. Whoa. I will cherry pick some of them, but I also include a fake one. And it's up for you to decide (laughs) which are the real titles and which is the one I made up. And if I lose, I have to saw off my own arm? Uh, If you lose, you have to watch this movie on Missed It. (laughs) But your eyes will be covered by your sawed off hands. The titles are as follows. Creature Comes Back. Bride of the Gill Man. Passion of the Creature from the Black Lagoon. Taming of the Creature of the Black Lagoon. 
New Adventures of Creature. Creature 2, Creature in the Big City. Science versus Gill Man. And only only one of them is not real? <laughs> only one. <laughs> what is your answer? Live or die, make your choice. Um... Yeah, I would say Creature 2, Creature in the Big City. Ah, yeah, that was the one I made up. <laughs> the passion of the creature of the Black Lagoon. Yeah, I think the original subplot of this movie was Creature was going to get crucified for his sins. Science versus Gilman, really? Seriously. The memo oh for this God. is incredible. <laughs> uh, I've been reading up about uh, old Gilman as there is a fantastic book called The Creature Chronicles. Which goes through the production of all three movies. If you're at all a fan of the Universal Monster movies, definitely pick that up. We'll have a link in the show notes if the book is still in print. Hey, everybody, it's time for The Shadow 13. Yes, it's The Shadow 13. 13 fun facts about both this movie and episode 801 of Mystery Science Theater 3000. But the clock is ticking. Beth, go, 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 go. Revenge of the Creature, like the original Black Lagoon, was shot in 3D. Reviewers put the creature on blast for not having enough 3D gimmicks. Yep, there was a time when critics thought studio films didn't have enough 3D. This movie boasts Clint Eastwood's first, rather awkward, appearance in a movie. This is referenced in Back to the Future 3. Marty mentions Eastwood, who Doc Brown in 1955 has never heard of. Clint Eastwood never wore anything like this. Hey, who? During the exchange, Doc and Marty are standing by posters for Eastwood's first movies, Tarantula and Revenge of the Creature, both of which came out in 1955. Clint plays lab assistant Jennings, who finds a misplaced rat in his lab coat. Eastwood would go on to star with animals in the offbeat 70s comedy Any Which Way But Loose with an orangutan named Clyde, who was regularly sprayed with mace and beaten with a pipe wrapped in newspapers to train him. Sorry, guys, this is not an uplifting episode when it comes to the treatment of animals. Revenge of the Creature, on the other hand, our heroes use dynamite to stun Gilman, and believe it or not, this method of fishing is not entirely uncommon. Referred to as blast fishing, its first recorded practice was by soldiers in World War I who used grenades to catch a fish for a quick and fresh meal. But this method of fishing is wasteful, environmentally destructive, and now thankfully illegal. In addition to being a universal monster, Gilman is a monster. Gilman appeared as Uncle Gilbert in an episode of the hit series and Adam's family rival, the Monsters. From his travels from the Amazon to America, Gilman must have learned the concept of body shame, as Gilbert first appears wearing pants, a trench coat, a scarf, and a fedora. And, of course, Gilliman would have a fedora. If you thought Revenge's plot was a bad idea for a sequel to an iconic monster movie, you were alone! When cameras rolled on Jaws 3D, its script lifted Revenge's plot and put Bruce the Shark in SeaWorld. To promote the film, Universal shipped the real Gilliman suits to different cities like, say, Cleveland, and got an actor to wear the costume and pose for photos for the first 12 patrons to show up for Revenge of the Creature. Perhaps because many viewers of the Sci-Fi Channel's newly acquired puppet show might only be familiar with MST3K the movie, the first episode on the network features a universal movie and references both This Island Earth music Great supervision. Give me a needle drop on some This Island Earth music. and quotes one notorious bit of that film's dialogue. Jerking around must have caused a flame out. In the show opening, Crow is reading George Magazine, created by John F. Kennedy Jr. in 1995. An attempt to marry politics with celebrity culture, the magazine got a lot of attention at first, particularly for its cover featuring Cindy Crawford cosplaying as a sexy George Washington. But it started losing money quickly, and even with Kennedy posing nude, it didn't do much to boost its flagging sales. Its final issue came out in 2001. Mike and the Bots mock Revenge's use of stock jungle sound effects. Oh, hey, listen to that. I heard the ooh ooh ah 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 creature. Yes. This instantly recognizable sound is the call of the laughing kookaburra, an Australian kingfisher bird whose territorial call was used in more Universal B movies than the creature from the Black Lagoon score. More on that in a bit. Ooh, who's a pretty bird? Mike riffs. Nice diva wig. The long nice before diva man was wig. born. In reference to one character's perfectly quaffed hair. Devo frequently altered their look for different albums and donned hard plastic wigs for their new traditionalist album, videos, and tour. These JFK by the way of Max Headroom wigs seemed to take inspiration from Bob, mascot of the Church of Subgenius. A founder of the church designed a poster that was included on copies of the new traditionalist LP. 
Servo compares the polka music heard before Gilman's Rampage to the Schmengi brothers. Stan and Josh Schmengi were a polka duo known as the Happy Wanderers on SCTV and were played by John Candy and Eugene Levy. Though overshadowed by SCTV sibling comedy duo the McKenzie brothers and their Hamlet-inspired film Strange Brew, the Schmengis spun off The Last Polka, an hour-long riff on Scorsese's The Last Waltz in 1985. Though it never gets named in the show, Best Brains nicknamed the Ape Lab Deep Ape. Oh man, how hilarious would it have been just to have used that on screen. But that's time! We have a new segment for all you listeners. We're calling it the Score Corner, or the Scorner, and it's where Adam will be telling us something about the score of the movie we just watched. Beth, if you had to summarize the score for Revenge of the Creature, could you sum it up in three notes? <laughs> I think it would go a little something like this. Ba ba ba! <laughs> now, how often did you hear that from recollection in this movie? Twice. Oh, no. No, you didn't. No? You heard that about 60 times. Okay. Uh, but I am curious then, on that note, how many composers did you think that this movie and the previous one had working on it? Uh. Let's stick with the do's twos. Let's see. By my count, five. Wow. Is that normal? (laughs) No. (laughs) Well, yes and no. It's normal for a lot of genre movies and television of the 50s and 60s to have stuff like this. Like, I know you're not terribly familiar with the OG Star Trek, but that's how they would score episodes of that. That's how they would score episodes of The Twilight Zone uh, as well, is you would often have someone contributing a score, but they would have their library of sound cues that either came from the production of that series, but also just the general library of the studio. So say everything that CBS had, everything that Universal had, etc. And the producers of the show would sub in tracks and they would decide how much original score a movie or a TV episode needed and how much they could or should even put in these old cues that always worked. And sometimes because the production was so tight on these things, they would just get a composer to not write new material, but to adapt existing material and just rewrite a a vaguely new cue around the same theme tune. But yeah, like Revenge of the Creature has almost all the music from Creature from the Black Lagoon, which was partly an original score, but also partly just things that were in the Universal Library that were being used in other movies. Like you can actually hear those wah, 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 uh, stings in like Westerns. Really? <laughs> and things like that. Like, they show up everywhere. And when there's a riff about This Island Earth music in this movie, This Island Earth came afterwards. Nonetheless, the Metaluna mutant, when he shows up, is given the creature's theme because they wanted to, like, juice up his appearance. And that variation on the creature's theme was, was written by none other than Henry Mancini, who did uh, not only the score to the Pink Panther movies and thus the Pink Panther theme, but won an Oscar for Moon River. Mancini was one of several composers who worked on the original Creature from the Black Lagoon, and Henry Mancini and a guy named Herman Stein are the ones who composed, I would say, the bulk of the music, along with a fellow by the name of uh, Hans Salter. But yeah, there's five composers in total who worked on the first movie, and then one more is added for this one, as this one had some new material written by a composer named William Lava, which, if nothing else, is an amazing name. (laughs) <laughs> and has, I guess, a bit of an MST tie-in in in that he is also from St. Paul, Minnesota. But the thing I find great about the score in this particular movie, so you've got the old cues from Black Lagoon and other movies, but you've also got reorchestrated versions that were done by whoever was on the Universal Law at the time, which was sometimes the composers, Herman Stein and Henry Mancini, who were just working on other movies. And it's like, oh, we're making another creature. We need you for 10 minutes. <laughs> And during the one scene where essentially the riff is there's a bunch of Colonel Clinks dancing, Mancini composed the jazzy score cue because that was kind of how he got into music, was writing like loungy jazz music. And he composed a, because it was only going to be used in the film, he composed a musical cue called the Gilman Stomp. (laughs) And that is the name of the music that is playing during that scene. (laughs) 
with this score, there is 59 minutes of music played. But in terms of original compositions, only about 14 minutes of them are are new at all. Almost all of this is recycled. So put away your oboes. That's the scorner. <laughs> All right, so this is the first episode of the reboot of Mystery Science Theater 3000 on the Sci-Fi Network. Not to be confused with its current reboot, don't call it a reboot. Don't call it a comeback, it was always here. (laughs) In this particular episode, we get a lot of new things being set up, that uh, many of which they would keep for uh, the remainder of the run, and some they didn't. So uh, do you want to mention a couple of them? What stood out for you? Yeah, because I, I'm really curious. We had teased uh, this before because I was really curious as to what you thought of Bobo here because he's very different from what you get in the majority of the sci-fi era. And I was wondering how you found Kevin Murphy's characterization and performance as the head of Ape Lab. Uh, I liked it. I, you were right. In, in this, uh, when he's a little bit more magisterial, it suits what uh kevin murphy does best i think and uh it seemed very promising i actually frankly wish they would have kept this going a little bit longer yeah kevin is so good when he's playing pompous and pseudo-intellectual like i know there's similar notes to servo but like that's what he's good at (laughs) Uh, especially with that you know over enunciative actor's voice of his he's great and i have to say Bobo and Peanut, with occasional appearances by Pearl Forrester, for me, would have been a better setup than what we got. And I would have actually preferred the setup that we have here, especially if they actually called it Deep Ape on screen, which I think is a hilarious name. I mean, especially since, you know, that you create that set. You might as well keep using it for a while. I mean, maybe they do. But, you know, it seems like they're going to keep the ape thing going for a while. And I liked peanut. I thought, I thought uh, Mike made a great ape. Yeah. In fact, if had they kept Mike around uh, for that role, it would have brought him back to what a lot of fans uh, have said was his best use on the show was when he would show up in the Joel era in bit parts. Cause Mike just had a great tendency of just showing up and really milking a weird one note character for all it's worth. Like playing the amazing Colossal Man, uh, playing uh, – what's the name of that uh, piano singer-songwriter who sings the Gamera song in the later Gamera episodes? Michael Feinstein? I know. I I was really going to say Harvey Firestein. It's like that's not it. He's really good. I think he shows up as Hugh Beaumont in several episodes. (laughs) Uh, He's really good at at these one-off kind of like sketch-like characters. And with this, you know, especially if you're a fan of him as the host, you get the best of both worlds. Like you get him doing one-off parts like Peanut and – or just a weird part like Peanut and you still have him uh, hosting the show. Yeah, like I really liked it. Uh, You didn't have any jokes really about – the monkeys just being dumb and throwing poop at each other. There was like a couple like that, but they weren't the only thing that Bobo did. In fact, Bobo doesn't really have much in the way of he's a big dope lines. Other things I thought they did well. I thought the nanites were very cute. Uh, would have liked to see more of them. I'm curious. This is a totally new setup for the show. And I think it does a lot more right than it does wrong in terms of the sketches, which is weird. This feels like such a bizarro world episode of this podcast because I am sitting here praising sci-fi era sketches and I'm like, what the hell? (laughs) But they're, they're, they're inventive. And even when they're not funny, they're fun. So that's, that's what makes it exciting for me. But they're setting up a version of MST3K clearly aimed at potential new viewers. And how do you think this compares to, we've also watched 201 and the very first episode of season one, both the Crawling Eye and Rocket Ship XM, which did the same thing. And then we also did... Um, oh, we did The Brain That Wouldn't the Die. First. Uh, 1101. Oh, right. Yeah, yes, we, we did. 1101. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, so we've seen a lot of beginnings so far. And so what that got for me is that beginnings are are difficult <laughs> they can be awkward like uh like pilots to new series so you can expect things to be a little bit dissonant and frankly out of all of them this one probably hits the ground running the most effectively hmm. interesting interesting i think they're like i said there's a lot more right than wrong here and 
I like where they're going with it. Let's see if they can make it continue. All right. Well, Chris, now that we've uh, essentially buried our creature at sea, did we by any chance get a random question from a listener? We sure did. Linda from Ottawa asks, well, she's first she says, happy Valentine's Day. And then she asks, what is your favorite romantic movie? I mean, aside from this one? <laughs> if we're going for like straightforward romantic, I would say Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. I, I just I like the fact that it it's not about two people getting together, but about two people falling apart and just trying to unravel why you can that can still be in a very important relationship for you and how two people can try to make things work and then it doesn't work and how you live with that breakup i thought was a level of maturity about romance that you don't see a lot in hollywood or in western literature in general which is usually all about the getting a dude and a lady together to make babies and then we're done yeah i think that the best romances really have their their foot in honest, real emotions and relatable situations, which is why my answer is The Shape of Water, which is about a lady who falls in love with a fish man, <laughs> which, no joke, made me bawl my eyes out for two hours. I was going to say, it's, it's it sounded like it really affected you. So it, it, it really did. It is a really moving, extremely well-made movie. It might be Del Toro's best movie, I say, not trying to hype it up it it it's really striking but barring that let's say uh you know i'm just freshly out of this movie and i forget about it in a couple of years i have to go to that standby romance of liam neeson and francis mcdormand and sam raimi's dark man <laughs> if you've been affected by the issues on this show if you're a lady scientist and you're tired of men being awful or if you'd like to ask Beth and Adam anything, get in touch with us. Our website is itsjustashow.com, or we're on Twitter at It Is Just a Show. We'd love to hear from you. You know, we'd also love it if you told your MSD3K loving friends about us. Uh, tell your friends about all the podcasts you enjoy, but, you know, especially ours. It's Just a Show is a podcast from Megaphonic FM. Find all our fancy little shows at megaphonic.fm. And thanks again to all our Patreon supporters. You can support It's Just a Show and access some super fan bonus bits by going to itsjustashow.com slash Patreon or patreon.com slash It's Just a Show. And if you want to follow up, on anything that was mentioned today on It's Just a Show, you'll find links in our show notes at itsjustashow.com slash episode slash 22. All right. So that's uh, that's the Gill Man bagged and ready to be put on a wall. What are we going to be watching next, Chris? Okay. So uh, Adam, if this is a Gamuary poem. I swear to God. <laughs> Okay, well, at least one of you seem pretty fond of Gilman. What if we found another aquatic creature, maybe this time a lady creature? Maybe they'd be able to find love, love, love in Season 8, Episode 2, The Leech Woman. Beth? Mm hmm I have bad news for you. What's that? This movie is more 50s than the movie we just watched. <sighs> you know what you get when you put together a leech woman and a Gilman? A little man? I don't know. A little Wayne? Uh, I'd have to assume some sort of lamprey. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> that's, that's indeed a logical way of putting it, yes. <laughs> yeah. You thought it was a joke. It wasn't. That's a joke. <laughs> this has been the Conan O'Brien Writer's Room with If They Made It. <laughs> okay, well, on that note. Uh, from all of us here in the Black Lagoon Studios, buh bye bye <laughs> I say goodbye also. All right. Take it away, theme squad.
Valentine's Day.